chapter 21. Robert Lamberton states that the inspired Orphic poetry had a privileged religious position from the time of Socrates and before to the time of Damascius and Holy Serapion, who, quote, possessed and read almost nothing except the writings of Orpheus, end quote. No wonder Orpheus was designated simply as the theologian, in much the same way as Homer was named the poet. However, as a privileged mythical auctoritas supplied the Hellenes with a highly selective and largely spurious quote-unquote sacred map of heroic Greece, thus deliberately shaping their collective memory and using a language quote, never spoken by any living person, end quote. This modified picture of the heroic past and a shadowy afterlife codified in 6th century BC Athens provided the pattern of the initially aristocratic pan-Hellenic unity in the alleged theological continuity of their worldview. Of course, the Homeric poems were read as Pythagorean or Stoic philosophical allegories, and Proclus defended Homer by linking his poetry with the god Apollo and claiming that the Homeric poems reminded us of transcendent things. In this case, a symbolic mode of representation becomes a necessity. Likewise, in the Egyptian tradition of ritual exegesis, followed by the Orphic, quote, paradoxical and implausible interpretive strategies, end quote, everything related with cultic communication and mystagogy must be symbolic. According to Jan Asman, from his book Semiosis and Interpretation in Ancient Egyptian Ritual, pages 104 and 106. For nothing in the Egyptian cult is just what it appears to be. The priest is not a priest. The statue is not a statue. The sacrificial substances and requisites are not what they are usually. In the myth of the ritual performance, all acquire a special mythical meaning that points to something else in yonder world. Everything in the sacred game becomes a kind of hieroglyph. The more there was to interpret, the more mysterious the rite became. The dialectics of interpretation and arcanization led to a cultural split between a surface structure of religious practices of something appealing absurdity. Led to a cultural split between a surface structure of religious practices of sometimes appealing as absurdity and a deep structure of religious philosophy, which finally developed into Hermetism, where the sacerdotal science of Egyptian paganism and the philosophical religion of Neoplatonism met to form the last stage of Egyptian religion. <coughs> After the so-called Homeric Age, or even simultaneous with it, a radical shift had occurred in the ancient Greek mentality as regards the understanding of the soul and its relation to the body. The shift coincides with the so-called Sa'ite Renaissance in Egypt and the Egyptian quote-unquote holy war, using Greek mercenaries, with Assyria. Precisely at this time, Egypt systematically turned to the models of the past, and this pious codification of cultural standards according to the eternal schemata is later reflected and made programmatic in Plato's laws. Asman writes in his book The Mind of Egypt, History and Meaning in the Time of the Pharaohs, 2002, page 341, Much more comprehensively than in the Ramesside age, Egypt now discovered its own antiquity and elevated it to the rank of a normative past. Almost the entire literate upper stratum, above all the kings themselves, now began to emulate Prince Khaemvaset by visiting and copying the monuments of their forefathers. This wholesale return to the models of the past was tantamount to a cultural revolution, and it spread into every aspect of Egyptian life. It therefore cannot be assumed that the people of Greece suddenly and rather spontaneously started to question the reliability of their traditional cosmology and anthropology. Making inquiries into the metaphysical background of physical phenomena and eventually discovering, quote, a difference between the corporeal and the spiritual aspects of life, end quote, as Rayan Fulverda supposes. 
However, all kinds of cultic associations were incorporated into the ritualized and interiorized procedures of salvation in the attempt to release that part of the person now called the immortal soul, Suki. Following, with the enthusiasm of recent converts, Egyptian theological and soteriological paradigms. The road leading to Osiris, Un Nefer, trodden by the initiates in their hope that death is not akin to complete dissolution, leading simply to the lamentable condition of the simulacrum of the body being lost, now became the mystic road to Radamanthos marking the release of the soul from the body. The separation from the ultimately devalued mortal body and subsequent transition may be somewhat ritually anticipated, or even performed, by the mystical symbols of the Dionysiac initiations. Ta mustika sumbala ton peri ton dionuson orgiosmon. However, the Orphic Golden Tablet addresses the deceased, the one who has died in either the philosophical or the physical sense, or one who is still in the process of learning the eschatological rhetoric as follows. Quote, Happy and blessed one, you will be a god instead of mortal. End quote. Olbi kai makaristi, theos desii anti brotoio. At first, this Orphic teaching of Soteria was a secret teaching which perhaps would look too unconvincing and ridiculous for the traditionally minded majority of Hellenes. The rhetoric of the secrecy was structured so that any secret, be it just a pedagogical fiction, needed to be revealed, whilst at the same time maintaining the inadequacy of attempting to communicate in words the mystical essence of the tality, which is to be realised only by ritual participation. In the context of establishing and keeping various practices and orders, the claims of secrecy do not consist in concealing some exclusive or dangerous knowledge, as the romantic Protestant esotericism of 19th century Western mentality imagines, in its obsession with secret societies and inward experiences of genuine initiations. Rather, it serves for the formation and maintenance of social boundaries, for the insiders, the established practices, Signs of distinction and solemn slogans of secrecy must be preserved and transmitted in order for them to survive as a community of privileged truth bearers. It goes without saying that these groups which celebrated all sorts of festivals and practiced telestic rites, that imitate festivals anyway, were neither the secret societies of Masonic fantasy nor esoteric centres in the sense employed by the quote-unquote universal post-Hegelian theosophy of those who accept the crazy theory of secret forces of evil operating in history and plotting against the Veros Israel. Accordingly, Luther Martin analyzes the quote-unquote syndrome of secrecy in certain textual communities, especially in relation to the hermetic distinction between secret, unofficial, underground, forbidden, and public, official knowledge. Due to this cultural schizophrenia that unfolded between Athens and Jerusalem, the entire world theatre was transformed, following Egyptian and Babylonian scriptural paradigms, into the esoteric book, open to sectarian reading and re-readings. As Martin explained, uh, explains this quote from Luther H. Martin's book, Secrecy in Hellenistic Religious Communities, from Secrecy and Concealment, Studies in the History of Mediterranean and Near Eastern Religions, 1995, pages 116 and 117. And this, cho- uh, this quote closes the chapter. Like secrecy, such literary productions create their alternative world. In such textual societies, reviled and rejected, the external world which represented from their perspective a universe of diminished literacy, beyond their own revelatory texts. They did not, however, fear this world like a local associations and oral cultures they replaced. Rather than cowering with the protective embrace of secret enclaves, the goal of such textual societies was nothing less than the militant mastery and domination of the entire universe. Christians, who had initially demonized a world of adversarial others, came to employ exorcism to establish their own Catholicity.
And when one of these cultic claims to an identifying revelation came to define the dominant and inclusive cultural reality, exclusivistic claims to sacrality became reimagined as the esoteric contents of traditions past. Occluded by a regnant Christianity, it is precisely the hermetic and Gnostic heritage that produced for Western culture its quote-unquote syndrome of the secrets.